Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Women's Wellness Lounge show. I am so excited for today's episode. So, of course, we're a little, we're an hour earlier than normal because I have another show that I'm doing today um, at 8 p.m. So we bumped you up just a little bit, which is fine. Why? Because you guys are home anyway, and you love watching the Women's Wellness Lounge show. And I have a special guest that I'm so excited about today. So um, it's National Public Health Week. And so I selected this wonderful lady who I have a personal connection with. We just connected so well um, in the realm of health and wellness. Her name is Shaniri Eze, and she is the medical practitioner of Eze Family Health Center located in Waldorf, Maryland. So. I ain't gonna, I'm not gonna steal your thunder. You tell them a little bit more about you. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Delana, for having me on your show. It's always a pleasure working with you. Um, so um, I am a practitioner with Eze Family Health Center. We're located in Waldorf, Maryland. Um, I do a number of services, including primary care, medical weight loss, holistic health, and aesthetics. Absolutely. See, and so I know there's this one word in there. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, but it's that holistic piece. So as we're talking, that's the part that kind of just gets me going because not everyone understands what holistic wellness and holistic health is. And Shaniri gets it and she delivers it to her her patients. You know, it's the difference between, you know, kind of symptomatic care or symptom management or just seeing patients versus that holistic approach. And she does it well. I love the way she models the care that she delivers um, to her patients. And that's how we connected over that. You know how you say you have that scene, that thread that kind of brings you together. And that's exactly what it was. So we're going to jump right into it. As I said, we today's show is really uh, focused around um, National Public Health Week. And the theme for 2020 for this year was looking back to look forward. And again, as we talk a little bit more, we're going to actually cover that and what it looks like. I know when this theme was thought of, you know, last year when they, you know, kind of put out the theme for this year, they probably did not know we would be in the middle of a pandemic, right? In the midst of a pandemic, but we are. And so the, what we're going to talk about is very relevant to public health, really like, a, you know, a pandemic is a global thing. So before I start, I wanted to just kind of go over some of the numbers where we are on a global aspect. And right now, globally, the pandemic confirmed cases is 1,425,000, 1,425,000 with a total death uh, rate of 85,314. Here in the United States, we have a confirmed uh, cases of 415,000 and confirmed deaths of 13,900. So that is quite a lot. Um, it's been a little over two months, kind of a lot, I feel, with us ramping up. And so Shaniri and I are going to kind of talk about that as we go along with the dialogue about how we, um, as a community, did with putting things in place to deal with the COVID-19. So we're going to kind of talk about that and then kind of sort of how it hit us out of the blue and where we prepared and sort of what happened and how that has affected our um, care delivery system and, and impacted our community. So those numbers, although they may may seem like you know kind of high and really startling, they are when you look at it globally. But at the same time, I think you know even here for us locally, when I was looking at the numbers, they seem high. But one thing looking at it retrospectively was that there's a lot of tests results that weren't back either. So it kind of looked like we did like this super huge spike or for, um, you know spike up or splurge in the numbers, but it really was that there were a lot of test results pending. So when you compare them in the grand scheme of things, when you look at the number of people that were tested, I think we're doing pretty good. What do you think, Shaniri? So yeah, I, it's very uh, good to see that, you know, we've definitely ramped up the testing. That's going to be a big part of getting a really good assessment mm -hmm. on, you know, how well, uh, you know, we're getting this thing under control. And to be able to implement a plan, we really need to know uh, you know, how many people actually have this uh, this disease. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, again, like I said, doing a better job with testing, having the testings available uh, and then having individuals, the proper individuals 
tested as well. Because I think Correct. initially we were, and I know you're going to talk a little bit more about this as well as we go on, but that really is key, is making sure that the right individuals were tested, if you will. Because I know when this initially started, we were thinking that it was just going to be the opposite demographic that it has proven to be. And I'll mm -hmm. share with you a little later because that was very eye-opening to see the demographic and the number uh, where we've got these elevated cases was not the number or the demographics that we were looking at at all. So right. let's jump right into it. How has your care delivery um, change since this COVID-19 pandemic began, even before it was really identified and called a pandemic when we knew that there was something going on, kind of like we do with the flu when we realized that, you know, it's flu season and all of a sudden you see sort of this spike. I think that's how I felt like we were responding to it initially as, oh, we've got an increased number of, you know, flu cases or the COVID-19. And then once we realized, okay, wait a minute, this is really kind of getting out of hand. So how has your care delivery changed um, since it's been identified as really being a pandemic? Right. So very early on, um, you know, through my reading and research, I knew that something was coming, we definitely had to be prepared. Um, mm -hmm. First and foremost, I focused on, uh, you know, training my staff, ensuring that they had the proper information, um, that they could answer any questions that patients may have coming in, um, and making sure we had that understanding and foundation of, of what this, uh, you know, newfound type of virus, uh, you know, can cause. So that was number one, and, and really um, for us to get the proper information and the education so we can adequately you know, inform our patients. So the next step we did was really follow the guidelines of the, um, at the time, the Maryland um, Health Department. And they issue out these you know, updates and directives of uh, what we should do as uh, medical providers and facilities. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they highly recommended was to now offer a telehealth or telemedicine option for our patients. Mm -hmm. So the day that I received that email, I immediately implemented that plan. We were actually able right. to find a servicer that same day, yeah. um, which was just amazing. There's, there's a lot of different companies that offer that service and we found one that worked for us and we were able to implement it that day. Um, so so with telemedicine, right? So it's yes. definitely, you know, telemedicine has been out for a while. This isn't mm -hmm. something newfound, you know, uh, this always has been something that uh, medical providers have had at our disposal, those who run medical practices. Um, have we used it very often? Not right, not no. Often, so. <laughs> still want that old, you know, kind of like, let me see it, I gotta touch it, I gotta feel it. I gotta right. have a conversation, so. <laughs> Exactly. So it's like that face to face, right? That's what we're accustomed to. Um, so really, uh, you know, it was an adjustment for me, you know, now um, opening this opportunity for patients to now see me virtually. Right. So I know many of your viewers are familiar with Skype or Zoom. Um, so it's very similar to that. I, I uh, yeah. basically sit down with my clients. They stay in the comfort of their home. I'm at the office and um, we basically do a virtual consultation. Um, so just like they, you know, if they were sitting right in front of me in the office, I would ask them the necessary questions, mm -hmm. um, you know, address their concerns or um, issues or questions, and we'd be able to address it. Of course, it does come with a few limitations, like obviously I can't do a physical exam. Um, right, right. But, uh, you know, a lot of things can be done virtually. So, you know, even if a patient were to be able to, you know, have a blood pressure machine at their home and they're able to check their blood pressure or check their temperature right there, I can still utilize that information. Um, in addition, one thing that um, I am able to do, which I do typically anyway, is send electro uh, prescriptions electronically. Oh, so it doesn't okay. require me to write out a prescription and give them physically a, a, a prescription to go to the pharmacy if they, you know, require medications. So um, it is an opportunity for, uh, you know, for us to really implement social distancing, right? Distancing, mm -hmm, which is something we hear a lot about, right? It's so important that, you know, we're not going out unnecessarily um, and uh, mm -hmm. not potentially exposing our Absolutely. And virus. Part, so yeah. um, in doing that, we did give our patients an option to do telemedicine, to telehealth. Okay. All they have to do is call our office, schedule an appointment, just like they regularly would if they were even, you know, coming to the office. Um, but this time we are able to set them up on a virtual visit. They go to our website. We They enter a virtual waiting room 
and then they wait till I log on and and that's it. It's that simple. Exactly. Like I'm visualizing it. And I think that was one of the things that I wanted you to do. And you walked me through, which was walking us through what a telehealth visit looks like or telemedicine visit looks like. And I was able to, as you were explaining it, visualize exactly what that looks like. The other great thing that I think happens with that is you don't have to worry about when they are in your office. If you were to schedule a patient and you go over, then you have two, maybe three people in your waiting room. So then you have to make sure that you're practicing social distancing there. And one of those two or three people that are in, sitting and waiting in your waiting room may be, you know, a COVID carrier. So I do think that you said it's, you know, limiting and decreasing unnecessary exposure, potential exposure to patients that may be, you know, persons that may be positive with the COVID-19 virus. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, you know, and then, of course, there's newer research that has actually been out for a while. They've, they've you know, started to now confirm that you know, people can be carriers without mm -hmm. having a single symptom. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Which is pretty scary. It's so, so very scary. That, yeah. Right. I've been so talking I'm about this now going on. So this will be week right. three or week four. And each time, like you said, of course, looking at um, research, kind of doing my homework, looking at what's being discovered in other areas um, of the world and just kind of applying that to where we are. Because I feel like here in locally where we are, um, in the DMV area, that we are still in the infancy of this pandemic. I mean, I think we're kind of crawling now. We've kind of went, went from infancy to maybe toddler status now, but we're still not quite standing tall and running with this. I just feel like we're, but we're doing good. I'm not going to say that it's not um, that we're not seeing progress. I believe that we are. But I think what happens is, and again, this is going on week three or four of talking about this, that sometimes it takes for people to really see or maybe be personally impacted or affected before they realize that this is true and it is happening. And yes, it can affect it's real. Yeah, yes. it's real. Yeah. And I say this over and over again, and I finally found a graphic that explained exactly what I was trying to communicate. And that was because COVID-19 cannot be seen. It's not like people are walking around with blood coming out of their eyes or foaming at the mouth or something like that. You don't appear sick. And because you can't see the COVID or the particles in the air, they don't realize how serious and deadly the virus is. And right. so I compared it to, you know, when you tell a kid not to touch the stove because it's hot, but they can't see that it's hot. So they want to actually feel it to touch it to see if it's hot. It's right. kind of like that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, that's it's, yeah it's, a, it's a dangerous game to it's play. A, yeah, so. It's a dangerous game to play. And that's what right. I feel like we've done. But I think now with what they're actually being able to see and what's being communicated, aside from fear, like I don't want fear to drive people's actions because that doesn't always elicit the right response. So I think being informed is informed is what elicits the right response. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that is something that uh, even I tell my staff in the beginning, it's just important that we inform and educate our, our, our patients about what this disease is, what it means, you know, unfortunately, especially with social media, there's a lot mm -hmm. of information out there. Absolutely. There's a lot of conspiracy theories and, and things like that. But when it comes down to, and of course, with us being in the medical sciences, we look at the data, we look at the science, we look at the research mm -hmm. and of what's, you know, what's real and what can be proven. Um, so, you know, essentially, this is a virus that um, even infectious disease experts, they've never seen anything like this. Yeah, it behaves right. um, uh, not in a typical way that most viruses uh, behave. For instance, someone can get infected and not have symptoms until almost two weeks later. Yes. Um, but it's what makes right, it so dangerous. It's very dangerous. And during those two weeks, they're still considered carriers and are shedding that virus and could be infecting others unknowingly. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what the scary part is about it. So here's the approach that I've actually implemented. Um, okay. What I tell myself and what I tell other patients, whether they have symptoms or not, while we're doing the social distancing, um, uh, you know, approach is walk around as if you have the virus and everyone around you has the virus. Okay. That way you're becoming 
more aware of mm -hmm. what you're doing, how you're interacting. Absolutely. It, you know, not to make you feel anyone feel paranoid. Right. But Ooh. it just kind of it, it really has That's to be different. a mindset shift. Absolutely. You know, we've never seen anything like this. Um, we do have to not see it as just the flu. OK, mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely yes. something much more insidious than that. Right. Um, so that's something that has helped people to kind of grasp, see. act yes. as if they have it and then also act as if the people around them have it. So that way they take the, the proper precautions to take, uh, you know, protect themselves as well as others around them. Absolutely. And that you touched on a lot of what I was saying before is changing people's mindset. So that went, mm -hmm. it was directly off of what I, the statement I made, how they weren't. I mean, we're just not. And I think even now we are, but that's why I said we're, we're in toddler stage. We're still kind of loosey goosey, I feel, um, with where we are. So you have the two extremes. You either have people that are really loosey goosey with it, or you have those that are just doing, you know, way too much. And they're thinking that they're over protecting themselves and, you know, kind of over protecting when really they just need to know the basics so that they're not um, wearing gloves inappropriately, you know, and those types of things. So it's right. sort of like I'm seeing, you know, two classes of how we're responding to this, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yep, so, you will see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, two classes. So again, thank you guys for tuning in to the Women's Wellness Lounge Show. I have my guest, Shinyuri Ezzi here of the Ezzi Family Center. If you're just joining us, show us some love. I see some comments here um, on the live stream. Thank you for joining us. Make sure you show us some love, share the video, start a watch party. I wanna say hi to Ruth, Wanda, Terry says hi. And yes, it is scary, Terry. Um, Laverne and Wane, and of course, Aunt Le um, Darlene joined in. So we appreciate you guys. We're um, again observing National Public Health Week, and the theme for this year is looking for looking backward to move forward. And so we're still, of course, uh, talking about the COVID nineteen pandemic and delivering care. Um, Shinyiri is a medical practitioner. So the next part of what uh, the discussion, what I want to talk about is um, we just talked about how individuals respond to it, right? You have the two different uh, responses, two different classes, either they're loosey goosey with it or they're super duper afraid. How has your call volume sort of been affected by uh, the COVID-19 between, you know, when it first kind of was some whispers out there that we were facing a pandemic to where we are today. Do you see individuals contacting you thinking that, you know, is it the cold? Is it the flu? Do I have allergies? Because it's we're right in the middle of allergy season. That's right. Um, or is it COVID-19? So tell us a little bit about kind of like, you know, the phone calls that you're getting and how you go through really a checklist or what do you do to alleviate your patient's um, concerns? Yeah, so um, of course, with all the information that's out there, it does um, stoke fear in a lot of people, and that's understandable. Uh, we have, you know, seen this surge of patients calling um, with concerns. You know, they have a cough, or you know, someone around them coughed, and and they have, you know, mm -hmm. some concerns about that. So we we certainly have seen that that surge. But again, coming back to educating and informing right. and giving people the knowledge, so mm -hmm. so that way we can quell some of these fears. But also keep them vigilant because, you know, of course, uh, some people do are kind of hypersensitive and, you know, think that they have it because right. they have a little sniffle. Um, and then, you know, and there's the others that are a little bit more cavalier. But um, essentially, uh, you know, I, I do try to inform my patients to look for um, the major symptoms of uh, the COVID-19. Now, the thing about this particular virus is it does present initially kind of like the flu. And yeah. that's why a lot of people try to conflate it like, oh, it's just a different type of flu. Well, we clearly know now, um, you know, how many months in that it's that it doesn't behave like the flu. Right. So yeah. we can't really dispel it that way. But, um, you know, the major what they found in uh, repeated research is that um, the major three symptoms, I call it the big three, um, tend to be the persistent cough, um, the shortness of breath and mm -hmm. a high fever. So right. that they've seen in a majority of the uh, of the people that um, do test positive, positive and start presenting with symptoms. Now, the thing about the, um, you know, we primarily see it as a respiratory um, disease and it, it very well can be. It's actually a virus that causes and leads to a respiratory disease, um, but it also can affect and infect the uh, gastrointestinal system. Right. So and I just people, heard that. Yeah, they were just right, finally people, telling mm -hmm, individuals right. about that. So tell us a little bit more about that, because that just came out. I want to say 
uh, the end of last week into the beginning of this week about the um, gastrointestinal symptoms, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So people are presenting with, you know, mild cases or severe cases of diarrhea, stomach upset, et cetera. Um, we tend not to see it as much as those respiratory symptoms that I, that I mentioned earlier, but that could be an early sign. Another early sign that they're finding is loss of um, taste and loss of smell. I'm mm -hmm. actually managing a, a patient yeah. who's now at home recovering who that, you know, who had those symptoms. That's how her symptoms presented. And then she had the cough and the, you know, fever and all of that. But that's what they're finding that, um, you know, it's affecting kind of multiple things and you could, you know, have a range of symptoms. Now, it's not to say that if you have all of those three symptoms, you definitely have it, right? Right. It's important right. that, you know, uh, if any of those symptoms do come up, um, that you do contact your primary care doctor. Um, and then they basically, you know, go through a series of questions and criteria. Right. To mm -hmm. see if you fit, um, you know, reasonably speaking, right. right. Yeah. Um, amongst other things, what are other risk factors you have? Who are the people around you? What type of work do you do? Um, are you working in a hospital setting or in a place where you can potentially be exposed? So those individuals, of course, would have mm -hmm. a higher uh, priority of getting the test versus um, someone who maybe has very mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. Right. Um, so and also, do they take into consideration um, your comorbid status? So other illnesses that you, you know, currently experience, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, you know, COPD, those types of things. I think what they also do um, factor that in as well to determine your risk to see if you, you know, I guess when they're categorizing, like you said, if you have been out, you know, traveled out of the country, do you work in healthcare, all of those questions. But I think also looking at your um, historical background as well to see, you know, if you have other comorbids that also increase your risk. Right. So what they found is that uh, with certain comorbidities, heart disease, respiratory illness, mm -hmm. um, such as COPD, asthma, also diabetes um, and heart conditions, that those individuals are considered high risk. So when they are, uh, you know, get infected or, or um, you know, with the COVID-19 virus, coronavirus, um, they tend to have worse outcomes. Um, right. They tend to be the ones that get hospitalized. They tend mm -hmm. to be the ones that need the ventilators. Um, so there are certain segments of the population with certain disease states that, um, are higher risk that we definitely need to pay more attention to. And, you know, um, those are the ones that we, we talk about, we need to protect and make sure um, those with autoimmune disorders, right? Um, right. They have a depressed immune system. Um, you know, those are the individuals that do tend to have uh, worse outcomes. Right, absolutely. Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to say, and this was something that I thought of, but I remembered I wanted to actually find this part out first before I just assumed. And that is a great segue into the next part that I wanted to just kind of um, have us talk about just for a few minutes. And that is another show we talked about um, how people, you know, there's this thing of understanding what cabin fever is. So we're going on like day 32 or 33. I don't know. It's been longer than 30 days, right? Of being in the house. That alone can be stressful to be in the same environment, to really disrupt your flow and your routine and things that you're used to doing and being outside, right? Right. Mm -hmm. how, so, and then of course, not knowing if you have been exposed, you know, kind of, you know, other family members as you're hearing, reading, seeing things that is, you know, as this is evolving, what are you seeing in the way of mental health and stress in your practice? So I think all of us to some degree are mm -hmm. under a, uh, do, are experiencing some level of stress. Uh, I, I like to say, you know, uh, analogize it to we're all experiencing the same the same storm, but in different boats. So there's some people that are able to handle it pretty well, can be very resilient, can adjust, mm -hmm. and others where it's a little bit more difficult. Maybe they've already you know had some major stressors in their life for right. you know whether personal or work related, and now this on top of it, um, you know the economic impact, you know, we're, we're oh, focusing yeah. a lot about the health mm -hmm. impact, but then the economic impact of it um, for a lot of people and how that's, uh, you know, causing stress. So I am seeing, you know, increasing um, 
cases of um, anxiety, depression, um, stress-induced issues that are now exacerbating the high blood pressure, the blood sugar is going up. Right. You know, all these other health issues are now worsened because of the increased stress. Um, so that's one thing that um, I'm very passionate about in, in really helping people cope and adjust to um, these changes that are taking place. Uh, you know, all of us uh, deal with stress differently. Absolutely. Uh, we need mm -hmm. to, right, figure out kind of work, what works best for you. There's no one formula that, that works for everyone. Um, but I always encourage people to not try to hold in all their stress, no. but have an avenue to, mm -hmm. you know, release it. So for a lot of people, exercise helps. Right. Reading a good book, listening to music, or even just talking to someone about, you know, what your thoughts and, you know, um, anxieties are. Exactly. I know that's what helps me just talking to friends like, you know, um, we're all experiencing this. It's not just. You right. Know, and I think that's the people. thing. Yeah. And you yeah. hit it on the head is, again, because we're kind of. I won't say isolated, I hate using that word, but because we are segmented away from our usual, you know, friends and yes, we're doing the whole virtual thing and we're kind of FaceTiming and Zooming and, you know, make probably making more phone calls now than we ever have, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> using our phones more. So I think that we're mm -hmm. trying to be creative in that space, but there's mm -hmm. nothing like the whole human interaction. And right. I think that's the part that I'm feeling that is you know, the longer this goes on, the more we're going to have to deal with the um, that part of it and sort of like the yeah, the the um, the, the after effect or the aftermath, if you will, about Absolutely. that. Yeah. And yeah. So, so mm -hmm. and one thing that I've um, actually that, uh, you know, we provide for our patients, I do these newsletters is a list of all the counselors and therapists that do virtual visits. Yeah. So there's you know, if you do need to seek the help of a professional, don't think that there's not any options because you can't physically go in to the clinic right. and, and see them. You exactly. know, everything's now going virtual. Virtual, so right. Are, if you could right. do telemedicine and telehealth and do a visit virtually, there right. is mental health services that's available. And I'm going to put your website up so that um, individuals can go there and visit your website, sign up for the newsletter so that you can get um, the great information that she shares out so that regardless of where you are, again, so it doesn't matter whether you're local or not, being connected and being able to do a virtual visit, if you feel as though, you know, that's something that you need is probably key at this point before we continue to go along. If you notice that, you know, you're starting to feel, you know, the effects of not having, you know, some sense of normalcy, the routines and things of that nature, because stress is a physical, it's although it's an emotional, um, yeah. thing of it ex, um, exhibits a physical response. And right. so, you know, being able to control that won't, you know, decrease your immune system and all of that great stuff so that it won't make you then more susceptible to the COVID-19. Yeah. Should you be right, in the right. Yeah. You, you hit it right on, on the head. You know, a lot of people are, you know, wondering, what can I do? You know, there's no medication. You know, of course, there's research right. on, on medication options out there, but nothing's um, def definitive and, and confirmed. And yeah. one of the things that we can do is try to support our immune system. Mm -hmm. And the way we do that, hydration, rest, getting yep. good nutrition, okay? Vitamins and supplements like vitamin C and zinc. These are things that we can do mm -hmm. to, you know, protect ourselves, uh, Absolutely. You know, uh, build our immune system. So that's very important at this point. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's what I was going to say. Give them some ways. And you already did that of uh, how we can protect ourselves. And one of the ways is to have a strong immune system. Of course, the first is, as you said before, is being educated and, and informed. That is, that is number one. Um, mm -hmm. that, and then doing the things that can pr not only protect you, but help you to prevent the spread as well. And so against that whole staying home thing and then the immune system, making sure that we are building up our immune systems. And stress is one of those silent ways that we don't realize it has a huge impact on our immune system. Yep. So yeah, decreasing that. So again, thank you guys. Some of the people that just joined in, we appreciate you joining in on the Women's Wellness Lounge um, episode.
episode. Again, I have Shinyuri Ezi of Ezi Family Health Services joining us tonight as we recognize um, National Public Health Week. We're talking about delivering care during the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, as usual, my lovely holistic medical practitioner has been sharing some great information um, about that and what that actually looks like. And so now I just kind of want to move into and say hello to a couple of people that joined on um, Queen Candace. We have Sabian, Wanda, Charlene. Hi, ladies. Thank you again so much for joining. Show us love, share, start a watch party um, as we wrap up and conclude today's show. And in closing, there's a couple of things that I wanted to just kind of give you the opportunity to share. And I don't even know, like when I saw the theme for this year about um looking back to move forward, I was like, hmm, again, I think when they came up with that theme, they didn't realize that we would actually be in the middle of a pandemic, you know, right. again, with public health. So what would you say, what type of um, pointers or even, even ideology can you think of um, that you can share with the viewers about how we can look back in order to really move forward um, post pandemic? So, you know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, this is something that caught us off guard to some degree, right? right? So we knew a lot of times when these type of epidemics and pandemics happen, we think of it as happening in some foreign country and, mm -hmm. oh, you know, it'll never impact us or, or get us. This year it did in yeah. a big way. Um, what is happening globally can actually happen because we're we're part of the world. Obviously, it can impact us as well. So in looking back to look forward, we really need to realize that that for one, we're not necessarily invincible, right? So so right. we're just as vulnerable. I think and we this have to be that, even though I think, like you said, we probably in some degree probably thought we were. I think this has proven that right. no, we're not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we, we definitely don't have an iron shield around us. Really, it, it connects us really as just humanity. We have mm -hmm. a, a, a shared experience. So, you know, one thing that um, is very important is that I think for one, it does help people realize the importance of paying attention to their health. Mm -hmm. You know, um, interestingly enough, I, you know, once all of this started happening, I started seeing patients that, you know, hadn't come in for a physical in years. Suddenly they're coming in <laughs> well, wanting to get their physical. Suddenly they're concerned about their health. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes. This goes right along with my health personalities that you guys, if you, any of you that follow me for any length of time, that is what I call the reactive Rachel. Like you've right. probably not been to see your healthcare provider in two, three, maybe four years. And suddenly we're dealing with the pandemic and you think, oh, well, I wonder what's going on with me. And then you want to go and see your healthcare practitioner. It, it makes us much more conscious. So, mm -hmm. you know, things that we used to do as far as ignoring our health or doing things that, you know, whether knowingly or unknowingly um, could be detrimental to our health, we're paying more attention to that. So again, looking forward, I, I think I'm hoping that people do uh, take a, you know, um, more vigilant approach to, you know, their health and making sure that they're doing the right thing and on the right track. Um, also, I think essentially we want to now, uh, you know, be aware of the needs of others. I think, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know That's if you've experienced this, Delena, like yeah. I'm constantly texting and checking up on people and, yeah. you know, whereas before I was always busy and, you know, you kind of lose track. I think now it's, it's really important that we kind of come together and, and try to reconnect and, and check up on people, make sure everyone's all right, whether it's health wise or mentally, emotionally, that's important to, right. to kind of um, be more aware of uh, the others around us, our loved ones. Um, another thing is now we're refocusing on priorities, right? So mm -hmm. and, and before this good. pandemic, right. we yep, that's were paying good. attention to very mm -hmm. trivial things and, you know, um, of course, people like their reality TV shows and things and all these distractions that we have. Well, all of us are glued to, you know, CNN and MSNBC oh, right. and all the news mm -hmm. stations now, right? Because that's where our focus is. Now we're reprioritizing, okay, what's um, what's important, to, uh, you know, um, in regards to what's going on in our world. So Absolutely. it's very important that we, you know, just really utilize this opportunity um, I know there's a lot of fear. I know there's a lot of stress, but um, this is an opportunity for us to literally sit back, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of us have to 
stay home, right? Um, yep. And well, all of us should be staying home. <laughs> right. But yeah. it really gives us now the time and space and clarity to, to reevaluate some things, right? Reprioritize some things, making sure that, you know, um, we're on the right track, you know, still being goal oriented, right? So Absolutely. certain goals that we had, we're still, we're still relatively in the, you know, early part of the year, um, making sure that we're still kind of on track with reaching whatever health goals or whatever goals that we want to accomplish this year. Um, so it really forced us all to kind of just sit down <laughs> and, yeah. you know, um, it forced us all to have a seat. And like you said, I think you hit the nail on the head with each of those things. But my hope is, and I'm very, um, I'm going to be optimistic at the, you know, right now in the midst of it. And I'm hoping that on the other side of this, that we all come out being a lot more grateful and a lot more appreciative right. of yes. whatever our circumstances are. Absolutely. Because as I said, you know, I've been covering this and we've been talking about this now going on, you know, four weeks. And part of it is, Everything that you just said is the reactive response, the, you know, fear of the unknown, you know, really kind of getting into being more available to not only our family, but our friends and mm -hmm. trying to see what does life look like on the other side of this. And so that's what I'm hoping that we're able to look back and then only to really move forward. I do right. see that there's going to be a, you know, I feel in the, not only in the health arena, with a lot of things that we've been able to determine that we can do, such as the telemedicine, I think we'll see that go up in some respects, right? Uh, as yeah. appropriate, uh, for sure. And Absolutely. then, um, yeah, yeah, I definitely think that we'll see that come up. Um, I'm hoping that the healthcare delivery field levels out. I know that we brought some individuals out of retirement. We, you know, kind of had people that were maybe weren't at the bedside, returned to the bedside. So I'm thinking that we'll even see some shift in the way that care delivery takes place um, as a result of that as well. So, right. um, so for the better. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely so, for the better. So that part of it, it, yeah, that gets five stars for me. I think um, we're going to see, uh, you know, once this comes out, I'm hoping that uh, individuals be more of a proactive Paula, as I like to call there them, we go. <laughs> yeah, be more right. proactive about your health as it relates to, you know, going to see your health care provider, these types of things. I feel like you definitely should know your status at all times, whether we're in the midst of a pandemic or not, right. uh, that this will prompt you, prod you that you've had time for the last 34 days or so to really sit with yourself and and know that you definitely don't want to be on the other side of this. You would rather know your status and kind of know what's going on as well. So let right. me see. We had a few people um, join in. So thank you all for joining us at the Women's Wellness Lounge Show. Again, with my um, guest, my special guest for this evening is Shinyeri Ezi of Ezi Family Health Center. And we're talking about delivering care during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we've had Nancy Kelly join. Hey, Charlene, giving me five stars. I appreciate that. Sandrine. Um, who else? Najia. Hey there, my promote her sister, my diva zone. Love, love, love you. And Julie, Judy Wallop Carr, how are you? So I have a few nurses that are on here. It can absolutely relate to what I'm saying. Some that are on the front line. And again, I want to take a moment to thank those. Of course, being us being in the healthcare field, um, Shinyiri, we of course have several friends and colleagues, even family members who are um, in the healthcare field that are um, frontline workers and care delivery. So I want to give a shout out to all of them um, on today, throughout this, and in whatever capacity that they're working on. Right. Absolutely. And with that being said, I, I definitely want to kind of give a shout out to my staff. Absolutely. I have an amazing team at yeah. the Health Center. Um, you know, uh, Season, Ebony, um, and Kenyatta. Uh, they're an awesome team. I, I love working with them and they know the importance of, you know, helping our patients. Um, we haven't closed our doors. We've reduced our hours, but our patients can still reach us. We're accessible. I have operators mm -hmm. who um, even during our closed hours, they're, you know, can answer the phone and get messages to me. So there's always, um, you know, it's it's really important to have a great team. Um, oh, absolutely. So and really I have yeah. a good team with me. It is. So thank you to your team. Yeah. Yes, you know, absolutely. It's very important, especially when you have like what we just talked about, right? Which is that fear of the unknown, that uncertainty, right. be able to dial and have your healthcare provider or designee 
answer your phone call is like golden. So yeah. you know, especially now when they're uncertain of is this cough or and you know is this fever or is this you know whatever are these symptoms that I, I'm experiencing? Should I be concerned about them and what should I do? So for right. you to make you know put systems in place that you have individuals available to help them at that time, I think it's key definitely during this time. So absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So this has been so great. Thank you so much for joining me. You know, I always can kind of go off. I enjoy talking about um, things that are in effect right now, things that are affecting people and being able to educate and inform them, give them real time information. And with us dealing with the COVID-19, it's like a moving target. We're learning things every day. We're seeing the effect every day, every hour, every moment. And so being able to just kind of come in a forum like the Women's Wellness Lounge and talk about it and really talk about the effects, not just on the healthcare side or on the medical side, but on holistically how this impacts us as a whole, you know, as a whole person. And so that was what I, my goal was for today was to also bring that into it as well. So I appreciate you for that, Daenerys. And again, I have your website up there. Is there anything else that you want to share uh, with individuals? Well, um, first and foremost, uh, it's just important that everyone get informed. Mm -hmm. um, there's great resources out there to get, you know, accurate information. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control is one. Um, also, your state health department um, is a good resource to know locally what resources are available. So it's so important that we really equip ourselves with the knowledge and the information that's accurate. So that way you make better decisions. You know, don't uh, hesitate reaching out to your medical provider. If you do have concerns, if you do have questions, there are resources available for you. There are people that will help you. So I just en encourage all of your, your listeners to, you know, be aware, stay vigilant, um, social distance, you know, yes. all those things. It's a real thing. Yeah. Washing our hands. Mm -hmm. We've heard this a million, a million times. times. Nothing's changed. All of that. Yeah. Yes, all of that. Yeah. So stay safe <laughs> and be grateful despite all the things that are going on, despite yes. how, how harsh it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, we, most of us still have our good health. So that's Absolutely. something to be grateful for. Thank you so much. And let me just check and make sure no one had any questions as we are um, streaming live. Everyone just says great information, gave you five stars. Thank Yay! you so much, everybody. <laughs> we appreciate you. And they were like, A, yes, it's great to have a nice team. So that is so key. You know, you being able to deliver um, great care also rides on the back of having a great support system and a great team. And so that is what I know, you know, that you have there at Esme Family Health Center. So I'm going to put your website up one more time. And then I want to thank our viewers for tuning in. Those of you who shared, loved, liked, commented, and or um, started a watch party. I truly appreciate you. Again, I am Delana Watkins, the wellness maven. My website is delanawatkins.com. Shinyiri Ezi, who is the medical practitioner at the Ezi Family Health Center, and her website is the eziway.com. So again, thank you so much for joining us. I thank truly you, appreciate Lena. you. And you guys stay safe. Always, of course, if you have any questions for me, just inbox me or visit my website, submit a form, and I will do my best to get back to you um, with the answer. So you all have a great evening. All right, good night.